Uh, I am uh, Stephen Hayward, Fellow of the Public Law and Policy Program uh, and uh, Fellow of the Institute of Governmental Studies. And I want to welcome you to our third of our spring lecture series uh, organized around the broad theme of democracy and its current discontents. I do want to make two or three little commercial announcements here. One is the final lecture in our series. It will be Victor Davis Hanson, who is scheduled for April 14th at 4... 13, what'd you 12, say? 12. 12, 12. I had to, okay, April 12. <laughs> Stand by for further notice. Uh, we think at 4 p.m., that location still to be finally determined, but check the public law and policy site and the sign up for emails because uh, that will be fine. We'll have a reception afterwards, I think, since it will be an afternoon event. Um, I also want to mention I've been working with, um, you know, COVID stopped everything in its tracks. I've been working with the Berkeley College Republicans to reconstitute itself and restart. Their first big event will be the same week as Victor. And by the way, David, I think uh, you ought to make Victor uh, one of your uh, events for VCR. Perfectly happy to have you guys join in the fun uh, uh, on uh, human rights in China on April 15th. Until now, I've got copies of the flyer on the table over here. Please take them, pass them around, and use them as you like. And with that, I'll get to today's principal speaker and our discussion. Um, we invited Charles Kessler here today who is known for a great many things, including the book you'll be talking about today, but he's also the editor of the Claremont Review of Books, one of the premier intellectual journals of the American right, I think you'd say. Uh, this particular issue is, my gosh, even I snuck into this issue. And we have a, a few copies on the table over here for free for anyone who wants to take one home with them when we're done today. Uh, but today he's here to talk about his most recent book called Crisis of the Two Constitutions. The Rise, Decline, and Recovery of American Greatness. Although, I can't help but uh, add that uh, we might, depending on how discussion goes, and uh, later on this afternoon, we'll have some opportunity to talk further with uh, Professor Kessler, we might talk about his previous book from 2012, called I Am the Change, Barack Obama and the Crisis of Liberalism, that was published two months before President Obama's comfortable re-election. So there you go. Uh, that crisis thing you didn't unfold exactly as you thought. Uh, we are, if you notice, coming in in the William G. Simon Lecture Hall. And so as our discussion today, we have the William G. Simon Professor of Law. That's why. Uh, that's why. <laughs> that explains it, yes. <laughs> who is Orrin Kerr. And uh, those of you who are law students uh, may not know Professor Kerr very well yet because he got here just in time for COVID to lock everything down for us all to go online. <laughs> So we're grateful to Professor Kerr, who's one of the foremost scholars on criminal law in the United States, to come and serve as a discussant for Professor Kessler's analysis of our two constitutions. Charles. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Steve. Can you hear me? All right. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Steve Hayward is an old friend. John Yu up there uh, is also uh, a good friend of mine. Um, we have, uh, I don't think I've, uh, I have cruised with both of these gentlemen uh, on cruise ships devoted to uh, political callings and discussions of one kind or another. And so if you want to, uh, if you want to hear any stories about what John Yu is like in the casino <laughs> or, uh, or, uh, Steve Hayward at the uh, cigar hour uh, after uh, all the programs. I have plenty of them, so uh, you know, just call on me and we'll change the subject. Um, I want to, uh, uh, in, in a short compass, just really run down the arguments of this book of mine, uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll be pummeled by my discussant, and we'll have some fun, and uh, I, I look forward to your questions about this too. Um, the Crisis of the Two Constitutions is uh, an odd title, I know, but I think it, uh, it makes sense to this extent. It takes off from the deep polarization in our politics today, the, the sort of uh, bitter internal disputes that seem to be more and more the new normal uh, in American political discourse, uh, almost to the point of suggesting a kind of uh, nervous breakdown in the American psyche, uh, or a kind of schizophrenia in the American psyche. Two personalities in one body, uh, two constitutions, two 
uh, conflicting visions of America and the way of life that it should be, the kind of laws, the kind of politics it should have, uh, contending against one another. And one could divide these, sorry, one could divide these um, positions up in different ways, but it seems to me consistently and deeply that uh, in a way they represent two contrary constitutions, two different ways of constituting America, uh, its politics, but also its society. Uh, one of these uh, uh, is for uh, shorthand purposes, the conservatives constitution, which I think is essentially the original constitution as amended uh, with a few um, uh, disagreements perhaps, but basically that is uh, the standard to which conservative constitutionalists and most ordinary conservatives even would probably point uh, as, as somehow definitive of the American way of life uh, versus the liberals constitution, which uh, ever since the turn of the 20th century, that is the beginning of the 20th century, they have liked to call the living constitution. Now, going to law school, and you probably know the famous remark of Edmund Burke about legal education, that it uh, sharpens the mind by narrowing it. Uh, and so uh, I'm here to expand your minds uh, a little bit from the normal legal definition. When you hear about the living constitution in a law school, you probably immediately think about uh, that this is a question of judges philosophy. You know, who is being nominated to the Supreme Court? Are they a living constitutionalist? Are, are they an originalist? What is their school of interpretation? And all of that is true and legitimate and uh, very important. But the people who first deployed the term living constitution didn't mean to confine it just to judges or just to the judiciary. It was an account of the whole constitution, the executive, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch and the new branch that they would soon set about to build, the bureaucracy, the administrative state, as it has come to be called somewhat in a somewhat ungainly term, uh, the, uh, the constitution that is in continual transformation of itself to keep up with the times. And it is that, uh, it's that living constitution uh, that I'll be, I'll be devoting most of my remarks to. I'll say something in the beginning here about the, about the founding, but I do want to concentrate on the gradual development of this living constitution theory and reality over the course of the 20th century. Of course, the term living constitution seems to imply that the other constitution, the 1787 you know, constitution, is dead or that it's on life support. Uh, and that in order for it to have any life at all, it somehow is dependent upon the constitution that is actually living, growing, developing, and advancing. And you need somehow transfusions of life into the corpus of the almost dead ancient constitution uh, of the United States. But I'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, when I looked at the, uh, the first part of my book is on the founding, the second part is on the rise of modern liberalism and the living constitution theory uh, of American politics. And then the third part is really on the conservative reaction to modern liberalism. Liberalism came first. Modern conservatism is in, in, fundamentally, I think, a kind of political reaction against the attempted transformation of American politics beginning in the progressive era um, about a hundred years ago, in fact. But when I looked at the founding, I looked, of course, at their principles, um, the things you find in the Declaration of Independence and to some extent in the Constitution, but not merely at the, you might say, abstract ideas of justice or more concrete ideas about forms of government, institutions of government that you would find there. But I also was very interested in the kind of character that they thought was required to live up to those principles, the kind of citizens that would be needed to make the American Republic um, a functioning republic, a viable republic. And so I, I, I used, of course, George Washington, the great, greatest uh, you know, um, 
uh, great man of the founding generation as in a way a touchstone for what kind of character, admittedly at a very high point, was needed to support American republicanism, to, to perpetuate the American Republic uh, going forward. What kind of habits, what kind of soul, ultimately, um, and I, uh, that term has to be used with some qualifications, but what kind of character, let's say, um, Americans needed in order to keep their republic. And then I was also very interested in the inventions that Americans resorted to to try to perpetuate those principles and inculcate that character. And above all, that is public education. Americans really invented public education. Um, it came originally from the Puritans in New England. They were the first to have public schools, free public schools in the townships of Massachusetts. The, the goal of, of course, Puritan schools was to defeat the old deluder, as they called him, Satan. Uh, but the, that, that moral religious commitment was to some degree transmuted into a moral political commitment in the course of the 18th century and the 19th century in the course of the founding and its aftermath. And we, it, it was really uh, Americans who developed this notion that common schools, as they used to be called, we would call them now public schools, common schools were an essential way of teaching future citizens to be citizens. Um, they taught reading, writing, and arithmetic, of course, so that they would be able to be self-sufficient economically, they would be able to own businesses or work their farms uh, uh, successfully, but it was very important that the uh, there was a moral and political context even to those basic kinds of uh, uh, sciences or forms of knowledge that even in elementary school students would be exposed to, and that was a context that taught uh, the justice of the American way, the justice of the principles of the Declaration of Independence, the justice of Republican government broadly um, speaking and the most uh, most of the most impressive founders wrote quite a bit about the problem of education from Benjamin Franklin to of course Thomas Jefferson who probably wrote the most uh, on education but also Adams Madison Washington himself often talked about education and wanted to found a national university um, in Washington, D.C., in the nation's capital that would help to educate the next generation of America's statesmen. There was always a very large public uh, component to the purposes of common schools right up to uh, you know, the highest form of college education in the mind of the founders. Um, and so when you look at the founding, you're really, you really are looking at a at a political beginning. Uh, conservatives these, these days like to quote, uh, um, uh, um, uh, what was his name? Richard uh, Weaver. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Republic, uh, conservatives like to quote, uh, uh, what's his name, who said that <laughs> politics is downstream of culture. Right. 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 There we go. Okay, sorry. I knew that too. Um, <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, died much too early. Um, politics is downstream of culture, but it is also a truth of political science and of American history that uh, culture is downstream of politics. And a founding is a is a, in a way a kind of interruption of culture. It's a moment in which you have a, a possibility of changing the culture to fit politics. And in the creation of public schools, in the writing of biographies, some of the massive of George Washington and others in the founding generation, um, the American founding really was an attempt to change the type of American from a loyal member of the British Empire and a supporter of the mixed constitution of Great Britain into a, a Republican political animal. Uh, and that change in culture was successful, very successful in certain, by certain measures, um, not so successful by others, but we can maybe talk about 
how you would want to measure that um, later on. But I do think the founders took founding seriously. That is, they thought about it. They had, in the initial wave of uh, state constitution writing in the 1770s and 1780s, in the creation of the Articles of Confederation, they had a Republican revolution without, you might say, a founding. And they thought they had to deepen uh, and radicalize, in a certain sense, uh, the, the, their understanding of and commitment to Republican government. And that's what the new Constitution was all about. Uh, it changed every state constitution because it changed the distribution of powers between the states and the federal government. And, of course, it, it deep-sixed the existing Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, in favor of a completely new one. Uh, one that was written in secret uh, in a conclave in Philadelphia and, uh, you know, sprung on the American public in September 1787 uh, for a year's worth, more or less, of uh, ratification debates in the States. It was very controversial at the time. It managed to squeak through and be ratified, and it became instantly or almost instantly accepted by all parties in America. We managed to get out of that rather tricky constitutional substitution uh, without a lingering anti-constitutional party in American politics. Both parties were, pro, were essentially pro-constitution, though they differed a little bit on what, what they thought it meant. But there was no anti-constitutional party as there was in French politics and still is in a certain sense uh, in the background of French politics uh, today. Now, um, but what happened to the founding? What happened to that consensus, more or less, on principles, which, of course, had some very scary moments in the 19th century? Um, at, the, at the beginning of the 20th century is the story of the rise of a new political science and a new politics. The new political science is well represented by Woodrow Wilson, who was, a, of course, a professor and president of Princeton University long before he became president of the United States. Um, he, was one of, he was really the only modern president to have a theory of the presidency before he came into office, uh, who had thought long and hard about these questions and written quite, quite a bit about them um, as well. Uh, as I understand it, liberalism uh, and I'm going to break this down slightly in a moment, um, represented a kind of um, uh, thoroughgoing but subtle rejection of many of the founders' moral axioms and political conclusions. But this, the, the project of transformation that, that was modern liberalism unfolded not all at once, but in three great waves of political speculation and political change across the 20th century. First, the progressive period in the second decade, more or less, of the 20th century. Then the New Deal uh, in the 30s and, of course, the 60s and their very protean um, aftermath. Uh, and the 60s is by far the most complicated and, uh, and, and filled with internecine uh, disagreements and the hardest to sort of get right, I think. But let me, let, me, let me just say that, on the whole, my late friend Tom Silver um, called the 20th century the liberal century, and I think he was right, he was on to something. The 20th century is the, is the century in which liberalism uh, came at American politics with the objective of changing it fundamentally, not once, but several times. Um, not, none of them was entirely successful, but none of them was entirely a, fail, a failure either. And in many ways, their effects were cumulative. Uh, when liberalism began, it was a movement of isolated intellectuals and professors and journalists. At the turn of the 20th century, it, was a, it took the heights of American politics just a couple of decades later in the 1930s. And it commanded those heights for a long time. In many ways, it changed American government in the 1930s in ways that still um, are powerful uh, today. Each of these waves of liberalism began, in a sense, in the university uh, with uh, heterodox thinking, a new wave of 
speculation, uh, scientific speculation and political speculation spread from the university to the Democratic Party. It was a little unclear in the beginning which party was going to inherit, you know, progressivism. Uh, there were more Republican progressives than there were Democratic progressives as, as political, uh, in terms of political nomenclature uh, in the country. But by the 1930s, it was clear that the opening that uh, Woodrow Wilson had um, discovered uh, for a, to progressivize the Democratic Party was a real thing. And so you find, you know, in 1938, uh, President Roosevelt gave a whole series of speeches in the campaign of that year explaining that the, the word to describe the Democratic Party was liberalism. It was the liberal party. And this was, this made, nothing made Herbert Hoover matter or most Republicans matter because they considered themselves to be, what is liberalism? It is the philosophy of the individual, individual rights, limited government, consent of the governed, rule of law, all of which they thought they represented very well and they were liberals. They were the real liberals. The Democrats were false liberals. But by the end of the 1930s, um, that, that battle had been lost and the Democrats emerged as the Liberal Party, and following a suggestion from Roosevelt himself, the Conservatives were stuck with being the, con I mean, sorry, the Republicans were stuck with being a Conservative Party. There are many disadvantages to the term Conservative, politically, uh, and Roosevelt, when he proffered that name, was well aware of them, <laughs> of course. And he was glad to see his opponents um, burdened with that name. But let me, uh, let me characterize very quickly the sort of the leading doctrines of each of these waves of liberalism, just to give you the flavor of the change that I allege came over American politics in the course of that century. So first of all, uh, the first wave of liberalism is what, you, what they call, what we could call progressivism. Uh, this is about the politics of progress, in a way, introducing progress as a new idea or a new sense of the term to American politics. For the founders, the Constitution is meant to set the limits of government. The Constitution is a form of law above statute law. It is a fundamental law, sometimes it was called, or even higher law, sometimes. And government uh, was under its authority. And the point of the Constitution was to keep the branches of government in their proper orbits, to keep them from encroaching, on, on other branches or on the rights of the people to keep government limited. But the idea of the living constitution in the, in the Wilsonian sense is really the opposite. It's the government that is meant to set the limits of the constitution. The, the needs of this generation in politics become authoritative in this argument. Uh, this argument is what Wilson called the Darwinian rather than Newtonian. These are terms he used many, many times, starting when he was a professor, but in, on the campaign trail in 1912 and in presidential speeches uh, as well. Darwinian meant uh, if, if you try to keep today's politics in, a, in, a, in the carapace of the 18th century constitution and its limits, that's why politics is uh, dying or republicanism is in danger because we have all these 20th century problems in society and the economy, but an 18th century constitution. And so what we must do is modernize that constitution, but not uh, fundamentally by using the amendment process, you know, the uh, described in the constitution itself, but by informal amendments, by continual changes in public policy, the creation of new agencies, the creation of new, the identification of new social problems and new agencies that will try to cure those problems. Um, what you have to do is continually reset the Constitution by the needs of the hour and the means of curing the diseases or the, the uh, maladies of the hour. And, and what is called sometimes um, the administrative state was really how government changed. It's how you continually change the government so that it meets the needs of a living constitution, not of an old-fashioned 200-year-old 
um, science from the past. And so in that sense, uh, probably when you hear the term liberal, I'm sorry, living constitution, you think that's just a loose way of interpreting the original constitution. And it is that in part, but it's more than that. It's really an alternative to the original constitution with a different set, you might say, of values or principles, and therefore a really different set of institutions and of expectations for how constitutions will change to meet the changing needs of the time. Um, I'll, 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 I'll give you a very rough estimate of the differences. Um, the progressive political science really begins with group rights, not individual rights. Individual, individuals get their rights through the group they belong to in the age that uh, is relevant, in the, the age of, the, of, um, of that group. And so when Woodrow Wilson wrote a textbook, and he wrote a textbook for the same reason professors write them now, to, to make money, um, <laughs> he, uh, he, the first question in the textbook is, and this is almost unbelievable now, which races shall we study? But this was the cutting edge of political science, a sort of Darwinian, social Darwinian political science at the time, as prominent or more prominent on the left as on the right. And the answer, by the way, was there are only two races really worth studying because they are the ones that have survived and conquered the world, basically. And that was the Aryan race and the Semitic race. <laughs> which is itself an interesting choice. But anyway, he, uh, after a few pages, it turns out that studying the Semitic race is sort of optional, and the, the race you really have to study are Northern Europeans, you know, Anglo-Saxons, uh, Germans, and Germanic peoples, and how they have conquered the earth. And of course, they had conquered the earth. I mean, European imperialism was at its peak uh, early in the 20th century, gunpowder, uh, you know, the technologies of, of weapons and, and uh, law and politics and so forth had enabled them to subjugate much of Africa, Asia, and, uh, and but for the United States and the Monroe Doctrine, they would have subjugated much more of the American uh, hemisphere um, as well. And so these kinds of rights are historical rights. They're evolutionary rights. Rights have to change with the age, with the needs of the age. And so bottom line is, rather than a limited constitution that is d dedicated to protecting the same human rights, which don't fundamentally change, they're the same in the 18th century as recorded in the Declaration or in other documents as they would be in the 20th, 20th or 21st century. If you have a, a kind of steady goal of protecting human rights, which are basically the same, you could have a written constitution that is hard to change, which is exactly the kind of constitution the founders designed. It could be changed, but it would take a lot of political will to change. It would have to be a big need, a big problem would have to emerge that would require such a change. The living constitution is always changing. That's what evolutionary rights mean. As, as rights change, government must change uh, with it. Okay, so now let me say something also briefly about liberalism. And, and I'll, I'll characterize uh, its waves. I, I, I've said a little bit already about uh, the first wave, sorry, progressivism. Um, the second wave is the New Deal, the politics of entitlements. And here I'll just mention one of uh, Roosevelt's great innovations, the Second Bill of Rights. If you've got a new constitution, a living constitution, you have to have a, a new Bill of Rights to go with it, to complement this new idea. And the Second Bill of Rights, which he did, doesn't announce until late in his term, he's, he's quite old and ill in 1944 when he does get around to announcing it, but it's implicit and discussed in part all along from 1932 to the end of his uh, life. Um, the kind of rights which populate the second Bill of Rights are very familiar to us because they are the bread and butter of American politics ever since. A right to health care, a right to a job, a right to education, a right to housing, 
a right to uh, unemployment insurance if you don't have a job, um, all those kinds of socioeconomic rights, which amount in a way to a guarantee of a kind of minimum standard of living. Uh, those really now are as important or more important in American politics than the First Amendment rights or you know, rights in the traditional uh, Bill of Rights. And there's a, a certain amount of, of uh, contradiction and collision between the First and the Second Bill of Rights, which Roosevelt tried very hard to hide, uh, but which has emerged, I think, since then. Above all, if, I mean, everyone admits that housing and good medical care and good education, these are good things. The transformation is to call them rights, to make them rights. As good things, you know, there are ways that public policy can advance housing and education and health care and so forth. But when you transmogrify them into rights, you imply that there is a duty of someone to provide them. You know, rights and duties are correlative terms. They go together. Whose duty is it to provide housing, health care, education to the American people? Um, Roosevelt played somewhat fast and loose with that answer because it obviously would be controversial. But in general, it was, you know, first of all, rich people who had more than they needed anyway and uh, whose money could be or income could be uh, siphoned off to, to do good for poor people and middle class people. But then, it, of course, it always turns out that rich people really don't have enough money to fund benefits like this for hundreds of millions of Americans. And so it's the middle class um, and the young who end up paying uh, for these benefits. Uh, therefore, this is uh, all of these rights would fall under what the previous generations of 19th century judges would have called class legislation. That is legislation that, if, that is deliberately designed to to make one class pay for the benefits of another class, that pits the classes against each other, rich against poor, and so forth. And uh, I'll say this uh, in, in conclusion about the second wave, it destabilizes most of the limits on government that came in the old days from the principle of private property and all of, and the ethos of private property. Private property now becomes it's still a thing, but it has many, many more political qualifications to it. But it's I was <laughs> MRI. Uh, okay, finally, the third way, 1960. I, as I said, hard to describe. But let us let me approximate it by saying uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who was once a well known liberal historian, capital liberal historian in America, talked about the shift from quantitative liberalism to the qualitative. Liberalism, which happens in the 50s and the 1960s. Quantitative liberalism means the New Deal, it means uh, benefits, you know, it means uh, social security uh, and unemployment insurance. It means, uh, you know, providing for that minimum standard of living, which is going to cost something. And getting those quantities right is what it's about. But the final stage of liberalism, the higher stage, Above mere quantitative liberalism, Schlesinger rose to qualitative liberalism. This is not simply about welfare rights or the standard of living as measured in material terms. It's about the soul of Americans. It's about the quality of American life. And the agenda of qualitative liberalism is, has got to be much more inclusive. It's got to be much more about your goals as citizens, your values as Americans, and somehow raising the standard of, of those things. If you look at Johnson's early speeches, particularly the Great Society speech, you'll see what I'm talking about. He made no bones about it. This is about making America more beautiful, uh, and exposing American citizens to um, uh, nature, to culture, uh, to community, uh, to uh, higher standards than mere material or materialistic standards of life. 
And so, to put it in a nutshell, the agenda translated really into a third bill of rights, uh, another kind of right that had to be added to American politics. And this is um, what we might now call identity rights, um, but it's uh, perhaps better understood as expressive rights. You know, this, that every American has a right to self-expression, not just to self-preservation or to a minimum standard of living, but to have your values, to be able to live in accordance with your values and have other people affirm and recognize your values. So, I'm talking about a right to your own lifestyle, a right to your own culture, your own morality, your own identity. And partly this was about things like environmentalism, you know, uh, 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 sort of um, post-material values, as social scientists sometimes call them. But if you look at the arguments, at least the public arguments that Johnson gave for the Keep America Beautiful campaign and the beginnings of environmental regulation and so forth, it was really, it was partly about, you know, doing justice by nature. Uh, to nature, but it's really about your right to live in a clean world. Your your right to affirm your enjoying your right to enjoy nature as it ought to be and should be and can be um, again. But that that's an important, but uh, in a way a, mi a minor part of the campaign for the qualitative rights. The other, the great themes of qualitative. Uh, liberalism had really centered around two other things, uh, which were very much at the center of the 1960s: race and sex. Uh, and race and sex have been have become political issues in a certain way um, as a result of the new directions in American reform or reformism coming out of the 1960s. You have a kind of right to your right to racial integrity. Um, to uh, you know, to have your racial identity uh, affirmed and uh, celebrated, and you have a kind of uh, right to sexual satisfaction, so that you know if you're homosexual or or if you if your gender is uh, you know not the standard issue, um, any limitations on the expression of your genuine sexuality are oppressive. They are part of a social, um, uh, what would you say, a uh, social uh, suppression of, of your self, the real self, your, your uh, authentic um, self. And with that right to affirm and express your identity came the second part of, the, of those rights uh, devoted to race and sex, the right to the recognition by others and by government of your culture, gender, morality, or identity. And many of our current problems with uh, cancel culture and speech suppression uh, on campus uh, follow from this right to be affirmed in your authentic identity, the real you. Um, and so hate speech uh, becomes a very important category, you know, not to affirm you, uh, to object to whatever homosexual marriage or whatever practice you may um, pick out of the, of the, of the new uh, sexual ethics is, again, repressive um, and is something that has to be um, not only frowned on, but punished in any case. But it's not just speech. Uh, as you know, silence is violence. And if you if you don't if you if you don't positively affirm those things that should be affirmed, that's hate silence. You know, and so it, now and so on the race front, you know, your your father's or grandfather's civil rights agenda has been transformed into anti-racism. You know, which is a, which is not, which is a different idea, really, and which does affirm that anyone who is not actively anti-racist is racist, uh, and, and from a certain point of view, even Martin Luther King's you know color appeal to color blindness 
in this speech at Lincoln Memorial and so forth. That's not anti-racist. That's that's um, uh, old-fashioned civil rights, which assumes that there's some colorblind identity that everyone has in common as a human being with human rights. That's a very now a very old-fashioned um, idea. Okay, so that's basically the, the, the shape um, of the argument. And it's because politics is now about so much more than it was 100 years ago. Uh, and not just, you know, economics, but politics is really about culture in a way that it wasn't really quite about more than 100 years ago. That our politics is so um, bitterly divided. Because if you're asking politics to affirm and to uh, regulate areas of life which previously would, uh, would not have been certainly central to uh, political contentions. And uh, this is, uh, leaves us in a dilemma, I think, because the, the stakes of politics having been raised so much in the past hundred years, it's very hard to compromise on these issues. Um, it's very hard to compromise between two accounts of morality, two accounts of rights, two accounts of the purpose uh, and nature of government. And so what are the options facing America going forward? Well, it's possible, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll name some quickly and then um, uh, retire. Um, one is, of course, that something can happen in our politics that is so big, so massive, that it changes its focus. And we don't have time to fight about these issues because we have a nuclear war or we have a, uh, you know, a, a pandemic on our hands. But we actually have had a pandemic on our hands. And it turns out that it didn't really change our politics. It just gave us a whole bunch of other issues like masking, vaccinations, and so forth to fight about, more or less along the, the similar lines that we were already fighting about. Okay, if we don't change the subject of our politics, then another option would be to change minds. Maybe one side or another, maybe the liberals' constitution, maybe the conservatives' constitution will win. You know, there'll be a, a realigned election, a really serious division of the country that emerges with a new majority, firmly on one side or the other. Uh, that's still possible, but it looks increasingly unlikely. We've been basically fighting about these things since 1968. Um, and there has been no new majority. There have been, you know, one party is up, one party is down. There is a kind of cycle to our politics since then, uh, but no resolution to these issues. And maybe, you know, maybe you can't peacefully resolve these issues. What else could then be done? You could move towards a more radical federalism. You know, you could try to decentralize these issues and give them to the states, get them out of national politics. But the problem is the modern state is so wedded to the notion of generating new rights and defending new rights, enforcing new rights, it's very hard to see it pulling back from that to something like you know, 19th century style of American federalism. Then I think the only Choices remaining after that seem to be our secession. Um, and there is, you know, America is separating in certain ways into red states and blue states. People are moving. Uh, you know, people watch, you know, red state people watch different television, they watch different movies, they, they live, listen to different music, they go to different churches, then blue state people sometimes do. We, there's a great separation, a great sorting, you know, has been going on already for some time. That will probably continue. Um, and, uh, but of course, once you actually contemplate secession, that is, making, breaking up the country into two or three successor regimes, you face the problem that we faced in the 1850s, uh, which is that uh, secession is itself extremely difficult and controversial and unconstitutional at least by certain lines, and so then you move from a cold civil war to a hot civil war, which is the worst of all possible outcomes. Um, and that doesn't mean that we're, we're doomed. I do see signs of hope, and I'll, I'll mention just one of them. 
Uh, and that was in the last election, even in California, deep blue California, which gave Joe Biden almost 70% of his vote. San Francisco gave Joe Biden 85% of its vote. Um, the, the, many of the same people, the same Democrats and independents who were voting that way, also voted not to um, overturn Prop 209, not to um, you know, strike down the state's nominal ban on affirmative action or, or racial preferences in hiring and university initiatives and so forth. Uh, I mean, that was interesting. Uh, on several other initiatives about raising taxes, they, those were defeated as well. So maybe there is, in fact, a kind of mo uh, moderation beginning to happen within the liberal coalition uh, that's not going as far as its leaders might want it to go uh, in terms of the new agenda, and which might form the basis for a kind of compromise or at least a kind of um, um, spreading agreement uh, in American politics. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, and, and I do disagree on a couple of important uh, aspects of this uh, very interesting talk, and I should say that I benefited not only from listening to this talk, uh, but Professor Kessler was also on one of the Federal Society's public forums recently, and I listened to that. So I've, I've got a sense of the book from uh, this talk and from the teleforum, although I haven't actually read the book, which is, of course, a big disadvantage in, in responding. But I will do my best. Not that not having done the reading has ever gotten in the way of the law. <laughs> It, it could be an advantage. It uh, could be uh, often yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, so I think this book and this presentation is trying to combine two very different subjects and present them as one. And I don't think it works in that sense. That that is the book. One, one topic is the culture wars, uh, which is really the, the defining aspect of politics in our age. Our, our current politics are really culture wars. That is what people want to talk about. That, that is all people care about, that, that is all they think about, that, that is all people tweet about. about. Um, and it, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the um, Republican Party in the last few years has been taken over by the most uh, skillful culture warrior I've ever seen, Donald, Donald Trump, Trump, who was just, just a master at pulling people apart and helping one side hate the other side and just drive up as much possible hatred of each other as possible, which, which uh, worked for him in terms of winning the election of 2016, and he even thinks he won the election of 2016. Um, but but, but that, that, uh, we are an age of the culture wars, and we have these issues, uh, 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 whether it's diversity questions, whether it's guns, whether it's abortion, on which people just dramatically divide and think the other side is crazy. Um, and acting in bad faith, and, and I can't, can't believe somebody could possibly believe those beliefs of the other side. side. So that's, 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 I think, what our politics is about. What, what Professor Kessler's book is trying to argue, at least as I understand the piece that I've been able to uh, see without reading the book, uh, is, is to root those ideas in two visions of the Constitution. Uh, and to root those ideas in a difference between the founder's vision of the Constitution and what uh, progressives 100 years ago or 120 years ago were arguing and the ideas of Woodrow Wilson when he was a political science professor and later president, um, uh, and then constitutional theories of, uh, that, that have emerged and sort of rough differences between constitutional theories on the right and constitutional theories on the left. And I think those are just two completely unrelated topics. I think they have no connection. Um, the, it's true that Woodrow Wilson had these theories of the Constitution, and when you receive them today, you're like, what? Um, he had what today very quirky views of how the Constitution was supposed to work. I don't know anyone on the left who agrees uh, with those views, uh, at least off the top of my head. Um, yes, it's true, one of the big issues in the late 19th century, early 20th century was how do you fit administrative agencies into the federal constitutional scheme? Uh, and Woodrow Wilson had no problem with that, with his theories. And of course, the Supreme Court eventually finds a way that it 
it construes our Constitution as permitting agency some subjects some limitations. Um, so that part of the debate has continued on, but when you talk uh, to people about what they think the Constitution means uh, or what politics means, what the Constitution, there, there, I think a lot of people naturally see their politics in the Constitution. It's very natural for people who are, have one set of views to say, yes, the Constitution embraces my values. And then the other side says, no, the Constitution embraces my values. What they're really talking about are their values with this document that really wasn't supposed to, I think, weigh in on any of these culture wars questions uh, uh, definitively, uh, brought to bear as sort of the, the source of authority almost in like a quasi-religious way. It's like the Constitution becomes this um, secular Bible that people can quote to to say their values are found in the document. And then you get these constitutional theories that academics develop uh, that sort of try to match that up with their uh, views. I think, you know, why is it that conservatives say, you know, originalism is the main theme? Well, I think it's because the conservative side of the culture wars is more consistent with values 200 years ago, or the sort of politics of 200 years ago, ideas of 200 years ago. The modern left has different ideas that were not so much found uh, 200 years ago, at least at, at a low level of generality. And so everybody, you know, the, the right tends to be say, oh, we're interested in originalism, and left will say, we're not as interested in originalism, but, you know, how much is that actually governing people's views as compared to just a rhetorical move that people make? Uh, I think you see an interesting aspect of this in how now that there is a conservative majority on the Supreme Court, constitutional views on the right are changing. So in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, you had a more liberal Supreme Court and conservative views of the Constitution were very much about we need to get away from the sort of living Constitution idea. We need to have a fixed Constitution. You know, as Justice Scalia would proudly say, the Constitution is dead um, in the sense that if you want to change it, you have to amend it, and the document is not changing. And that was a whole set of ideas about sort of limiting the discretion of judges at a time when the Supreme Court was on the liberal side of things and had been for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and so now, on the other hand, you have a conservative Supreme Court, and look at how the constitutional theories on the right are changing. So first of all, originalism is very much, like, well, you know, you can have, the, you be inspired by the original uh, frame, but then how to implement that actually requires a lot of creativity. You have common good constitutionalism, which has become popular in some uh, aspects of the right, which is just living constitutionalism with the label originalism back on it. And there's really nothing, as far as I can tell, methodologically that really distinguishes sort of the turn in modern views on the right of the Constitution from what used to be the left living constitutionalism. Uh, and, and what's going on, I think, is, again, there's the theorists of the Constitution and what people think the Constitution means, and then there's the culture wars, and to bridge those gaps, I just, I just think they're two separate topics. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm not persuaded, persuaded that when we look, look at our politics today, we're, we're really seeing the framers, uh, we're really seeing you know, what the federal constitution was supposed to be about, which was really setting up the structure of the national government. Really. It, was, it was not supposed to be day to day what you're thinking about is the constitution, uh, or day to day you know, what people are tweeting about. <laughs> that, that, that's a different set of questions. The constitution itself was just like, okay, you send some people off to Washington, D.C., and there's, a, there's some authority they have to regulate interstate commerce, and they deal with you know, imported you know, taxes on imports, and they do certain things. Granted, what the federal government can do has expanded, obviously, and we can disagree with, with how, how the Supreme, Supreme Court has permitted that expansion. But, but I, think I think the things, things that the Constitution are worried about and the things that our politics are worried about are just really, really different. Um, and and I, think, I think it's just tough to combine those into one topic. And I, 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 I one, one, um, one, one way, one comment Professor Kessler made struck me as really interesting. And he said, um, if I got the quote correctly, that it's the character to live up to the principles in the Constitution that's at issue. And once, and once you go from, from a legal document, document, a fundamentally legal, legal document about the structure of a government entity, to the, the character that's needed to live up to that document, document, I think you've really switched over to a separate question, because the nature of the document was that it would incorporate any character. 
Okay. Whatever, Whatever your character, character is, you're in a state, state you, you have your state, state government, government, and then, then there's, there's the federal government. government. I, I, I see at least the Constitution uh, as incorporating any character, and the character question is quite different from the, the government question, from my perspective. All right, that's my question. We've got about less than 10 minutes left. Do you want to do a brief response to one part of this? Otherwise, we've got some sharpening questions. Well, why don't we just go? I, I talked long enough. Why, why don't we go to this, somebody else's questions? Does anybody else in the audience have a question for either speaker? Yes. Yeah, I know, I'd like to ask a, a question to Professor Kessler. You know, I thought that your comment uh, on the interaction of politics and culture was quite perceptive in the sense that we tend to focus on one direction of influence these days. Um, and I wonder, you know, if today we can affect a, let's say, uh, a reversal of some of the sort of, let's say, cultural trend through uh, let's say, a canny manipulation of political institutions like the Supreme Court, which is to say, can we recover that sort of fabled American constitutional order of the pre-progressive era uh, via political action? Or are we doomed to sit here Tacitus style and wring our hands about the passing of the Republic? Um, <clears throat> well, that's a good question. Um, oh, do you want me to answer? Yeah, <laughs> um, No, I think there are some things you can do. I mean, the the battles over school board elections uh, show a kind of an immediate nexus where um, you know popular democracy can intervene in schools and change the curriculum uh, potentially, change the you know the the uh, the values that are being inculcated in those schools. Uh, and and uh, we, we used to have, of course, in America, many, many thousands more school districts than we now have. It used to be much easier to have a kind of, um, you know, democratic grassroots uh, check on education and support of education at the same time. Um, we have consolidated so many districts uh, into larger super districts that it is, uh, it, it's administratively now much more convenient to be on the school administration side because you have uh, essentially reduced the amount of input, uh, inputs for democratic, you know, for parents and others who want to complain. But I do think that there's, a, yes, you can, um, it's not, it, it's not hopeless, uh, and, uh, you know, American politics is always uh, regenerative in some ways. Um, it, the, the capacity uh, is still there, but it is harder than it was in the past because politics is more pervasive than it used to be. I'm just curious in terms of the court. Let's suppose, you know, you said that the, the adoption of the Constitution set in train a, a new political culture which then you know, trickles down into people's lives, et cetera, Republican forms. Right. Let's mm -hmm. say we have a court that somehow becomes right enough that it strikes down Chevron deference. Mm -hmm. uh, that pairs back the administrative state. Should we, is there hope for that? Do you think that, that helps us? Is that a possible route back to a more limited, uh, you know, sort of paleo-Republican idea? Well, well, if, if, if you're, you're asking, asking can the court do it on its own, I would say no. I mean, uh, but I think, you know, courts do follow the election returns to a certain extent. Uh, and, and the prevailing doctrines in politics in the country. And uh, if the court is, uh, uh, you know, supported legislatively by uh, complementary new laws that are passed, uh, yes, then I think it... It is possible. All right. Anybody else with a question? Fred. Um, John, I'll have to to say I did not read none of your books. I'm not sure if you address this in your book. But I was curious. You talk about the uh, the two constitutions. I'm wondering, because you mentioned you know, the original Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Right. It's kind of the second Bill of Rights that was proposed in the New York League during the deal. And the third Bill of Rights during the Great Society era. So I'm wondering, why wouldn't it be the three constitutions? Was the third constitution, or yeah? Second subsumed by third, uh, or is it just you know, the second dialogue, yeah. basically? Or yeah. What's the no, 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 that's a perfectly good 
good, good question. question. I, think I think because the, the, the third, third Bill of Rights is part of an, uh, of a, of an iterative, iterative strategy. strategy. You know, there, there can, can be a fourth Bill of Rights, rights too, in the living Constitution. I mean, you've, you've opened, opened the door to the evolution of rights. Of rights. Uh, James, James McGregor, McGregor Burns, who was once a well-known political scientist, wrote a book about the Bills of Rights in which he essentially predicted that there could be, you know, the 10 bills of rights, each focusing on a new, uh, a different group of people, a different group of concerns, and a different group of things now to be called rights. His example was there ought to, ought to be a bill of rights for artists. And his example was, what if, um, what if you're an artist in Manhattan, you live in a, in a garret, but your art uh, is... <laughs> the, way the way you express, express yourself in your art is on massive canvases, canvases. but your, your apartment, apartment is too small for you to have a massive canvas, canvas in there to paint. paint. Shouldn't, Shouldn't you have a right to have, have you know, the government could provide you a place to go with massive canvases, canvases so that you could express yourself. And, and he thought it was a great idea. We call it chopping call. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> We make a quick observation, which you can comment if you want to, and then I think a challenge for both of you. I'll just say, or in your final comment about how, I'll raise it in this way, too narrowly, but the Constitution is a set of decision rules for the national government. Uh, and therefore, uh, the questions of the character get you to an excellent little dimension to really fast that should be kept in a separate realm. Perfectly culture to point, you can expect that from people who do legal analysis of law professors. I did know that in some of the questions and characters, you thought of being a conservative enthusiasm. And I do recall you now, back in the 90s, there was this enthusiasm on the left of all the legal scholars for what they were called civic republic revival. That started to sound a little bit like what Professor Tapas was talking about. And by the way, I think, Charles, you understate in your talk today that your understanding of the Constitution was not simply the formal part. But it also more like a risk to healing and understanding the Constitution as a way of life, which is more patient than just the lead document. That's just an observation I made. Mean, it's a strange world. I don't know that the whole secret public and libel and less is still going on or not. I haven't kept up with it. This is back in the mid 90s. That's a long time ago now. But the whole theory of laundry articles. And suddenly, the legal officer can discover Gordon Wood. Anyway, it was interesting. Um, well, I'm going to do this question for both of you. Charles, you mentioned that uh, Wilson said that the problem is we have an 18th century constitution for 20th century problems. So first of all, point one, there were real problems, of course, mm -hmm. right? And we did pass some amendments. You know, we had an income tax, direct election senators, um, uh, suffrage for women, and all oh, prohibition. We got a science as an object lesson. And then in the 60s, we had some constitutional amendments, mostly bold, not much the, the old civil rights movement. movement. Yeah. Yeah, right. There were constitutional amendments. So, so the point is, you could pass constitutional amendments. The odd one now is the 30s, when even with the enormous Democratic majority after 36, Roosevelt opted uh, not to pursue constitutional amendments for similar reasons. It was also just too difficult. Uh, do you think it was because they thought it was too difficult? Or do you think that they calculated it would be better not to be trying to tangle the language of the Constitution and instead? Yeah, yeah, I well, I would say, um, yes, I mean, if, if you look at the politics of amendments, uh, you'll see that they tend, to, they tend to be passed, beginning with the Bill of Rights, in bursts. They're, they represent waves of political reform. And so you have the, you have the, the burst in you know, 1791, you have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments after the Civil War. Uh, you have the Progressive Amendments. Uh, but then, yes, then the correlation between politics, political reform, and constitutional reform begins to uh, fade away. You don't have really, I mean, you have the poll tax amendment, but that's a small change, I think. I think it's because uh, we, we pass fewer and fewer constitutional amendments because the, our amendments are all done informally through the, the living, living constitution. constitution. The, the advantage, one, 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 one great advantage of the living constitution is you don't have to go the formal amendment route, which is very difficult. And after what happened to the ERA, 
you know, the Equal Rights Amendment, which was on the verge of passage, but suddenly defeated in the 1970s, I think uh, the left said, it's not worth it. I mean, let's just, let's do it administratively, let's do it through the court, uh, and to, to a limited degree legislatively, sort of the Bruce Ackerman route. You know, you, ha you could have super majorities in the legislature, or maybe on the court, or maybe in the bureaucracy, who enact the will of the people, the amendments, the, the changes, they would enact constitutionally, except it's so damn troublesome, you know? Or I think it would have been on that question. I just say that the did amazing work in drafting the Constitution with a few glaring flaws, and one of the glaring flaws was how difficult it is to amend the Constitution. And all these questions of constitutional interpretation and all these theories really are just a reflection of it's, it's so hard, hard to pass a constitutional amendment, amendment. You, you have, have to rely on the courts. Um, uh, and, and, and in a world where uh, we have these you know, culture wars that are dividing our politics nearly 50-50, constitutional amendments are not going to pass. And so it's sort of about courts or nowhere else. So unfortunately, that's, you, know, I, you can imagine what the world would have been like if the Constitution had been easier to amend. We might not have all of these debates. We just resolve them through actually formally amending the Constitution, which would make a lot of sense. We are up against our time limit. I want to thank our two, our three co-sponsors, uh, the Jack Miller Center, the Federal Society here at Berkeley Law, uh, the Public Law and Policy Program, uh, and thank our two speakers, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>